Hello, and welcome to a, a fireside chat with Dr. Childers, where I will be um, redoing my 2017 presentation to the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, the AFCC, uh, with Dorsey Pruder. And this is part one, where I will be re-presenting uh, my talk to the AFCC in 2017 uh, regarding the, uh, an attachment-based model of parental alienation, my work in, in describing what the pathology is. And then there's a separate um, presentation, a separate redo of the presentation that uh, um, regarding what we talked about in the PowerPoint for the dorsey Purter section regarding the high road uh, workshop and how that achieves its success. So uh, in the original talk, it was a full 90-minute presentation. Uh, in this talk, I will be breaking it up into the first part, which is the, my work kind of stuff, and then the second part, talking about uh, Dorsey Pruder and the High Road Workshop. So the reason that I'm doing this now, representing a, some, a talk I gave in uh, 2017, is partly because I can. Uh, people need to stop thinking Flatlander. We have the internet now. So I have the PowerPoint. I can give the presentation anytime. And so now it, I will. And so now it's going to be publicly available to everyone everywhere. The 2017 presentation of Dr. Childress um, regarding my work and the High Road Workshop. There was a little involvement from Miss Pruder at the time where she would get up and, and present a little bit about what she does and then she talked about case studies but there was a powerpoint that i presented regarding the high road um, describing what it was doing um, and we integrated the two into the the second part of the the talk and so i'll be presenting my integration side of of that uh, talk in a separate um, seminar online seminar here um, this one though uh, about representing the my talk to them, my part from 2017, um, has to do with what I'm intending to do next, which is to do an online seminar regarding the AFCC 2024 symposium theme, um, which is Shaping the Future, Screening and Assessing for Safety and Well-Being of Parent-Child Relationships. Well, holy cow, that's that's something that that I can certainly talk about, which I will do. Um, I, I, people need to stop thinking Flatlander. We can do seminars. We can do online professional discussions. Um, we have new communication media that we can use, and we need to start uh, availing ourselves to it in order to improve the quality of professional standards of practice. So um, in preparation for doing that seminar, um, I want to take a look again at what I talked to them about in 2017. Um, because in 2017, uh, I was that presentation was in response to ethical obligations that I have. And so I want everybody to understand that as we go in and, and look at what I talked to them about in 2017 is that I have ethical obligations, mandatory, required, uh, under standard 1.04 and 1.05 of the APA Ethics Code. When I encounter psych, um, a situation where I believe psychologists may have uh, done something unethical, and in this case, it's a lot of psychologists, it's a domain of psychology, the forensic psychologist. So here's 1.04, mandatory obligations required of me. When psychologists believe that there may have been an ethical violation by another psychologist, they attempt to resolve the issue by bringing it to the attention of that individual if an informal resolution appears appropriate and the intervention does not violate any confidentiality rights that may be involved. So that was my, the motivation for my presentation 
in 2017 to them is I am responding to this ethical obligation and I'm going and informally notifying them of the concerns involved. Now, let me explain something about psychologists and what we do and what we're supposed to do is that when we encounter a difficult situation, the, the, the difficult um, decision making in a situation, the first thing we should be doing is turning to the ethics code uh, relevant to that type of situation. Uh, and so when I encounter a situation in the family courts where I'm looking at a lot of unethical practice, uh, boundaries of competence issues, 2.04, bases for scientific and professional judgments, 9.01, bases for assessment, um, duty to protect obligations from children, duty to protect obligations for parents. There's just a lot of ethical concerns and professional practice concerns. The first thing I do, or should do, well, we do, is to turn to the, what are the ethical principles involved that govern that type of situation, which is what I did. And so you know, I look at my ethical obligations, 1.04, to informally notify them. So I went to the AFCC to do that, to tell them of the concerns involved in what they're doing. And as long as I'm going to the AFCC and I you know Dorsey Pruder has the high road workshop and oh my goodness, you guys should get to know each other, you know, for forensic psychology, you should meet at Dorsey Pruder and learn what she's doing with the high road because oh my goodness. So as long as I'm going to the high road, I'm going to the, the convention, I, I took Dorsey along so that she could present we could, we could present the high road. I, I explained it at a professional level, and I'll, you'll hear that in the other seminar, um, it, so that they could know what was happening with these, uh, with these workshop approach um, and begin to collaborate and develop um, that approach to recovery. Uh, and so I've kind of felt that was my ethical obligation too, knowing that we have a, an effective four-day workshop approach is to introduce that approach to the forensic psychologist. And so in addition, though, um, that was back then. Currently, I'm, I'm, I have 1.05 as active, which is if an apparent ethical violation has substantially harmed or is likely to substantially harm a person or organization and is not appropriate for informal resolution under standard 1.04, informal resolution of ethical violations, or is not resolved properly in that fashion, psychologists take further action appropriate to the situation. So that's the situation. As I look at my ethical obligations in this, uh, when I'm encountered, first encountered the, uh, the concerns in the family courts, I'm looking at 1.04 says, don't you know, rush immediately to licensing boards and all these kind of, handle it informally. Okay, so I did that. I went to the national convention and that's what I will be showing you or discussing today is I tell them. And that, but that didn't resolve things and it's not really, informal resolution is not a resolution to what's going on in the family courts. So now I am required, mandatory, to take further action appropriate to the situation. What is that further action? Well, they offer some suggestions, which is uh, might include referral to state or national committees on professional ethics, to state licensing boards, or to the appropriate institutional authorities. So that is my current, 2024, that's my current operating mandate from the APA uh, ethics code, is to take further action appropriate in, to the situation in those general domains. So I would think of the uh, appropriate institutional authorities would be the state legislatures, licensing boards. Uh, I don't know what's happening with them, but it's like, we'll see what happens there. That would be an appropriate source. I'm telling parents to go to the licensing boards because that's an appropriate resolution for the ethical violations in, in the family courts by these forensic psychologists. And then where's the APA? You know, so ultimately it will be, that was a petition to the APA and ultimately it's going to be something to the ethics committee of the APA as to why aren't the APA doing something about the ethical violations in the family courts. But that's my current kind of 
uh, operating mandate in this situation. So within that context, this is the presentation I made to the AFCC in uh, 2017. Now I'm going to kind of hopefully run through this pretty uh, quickly because it's the same thing I say everywhere. And so the first part, I simply tell them in detail kind of what the pathology is uh, in using established constructs and principles. I should not have to educate them, by the way. They should already know this stuff. It's not my obligation to educate them. It is their job to already know. So I'm being generous. I'm being nice by educating the doctors about what the pathology is that they should already know what they're doing. Okay, so that's that's a problem to begin with. But I'm doing it. I'm educating them. And then I introduce them to their um, their obligations. And then I kind of describe the situation. And then I offer them a solution for the situation in the family courts. Then we go into, I explained Dorsey Pruder's high road workshop. In all in 90 minutes. Okay, so here we go. 2017, uh, attachment based model of parental alienation, diagnosis and treatment, Childress and Pruder. An attachment based model of parental alienation. My site to my book, Foundations, and to two online seminars, which are still up there, uh, still online uh, from the California Southern University Master's Lecture Series on an attachment-based model of parental alienation. Let me be clear, attachment-based model of parental alienation, ABPA, is not a new theory. It's not something to Dr. Childers. It's simply a label for applied knowledge. Okay, so I'll describe all the knowledge in this seminar, but it's simply a label, apply knowledge. Don't get caught up in Dr. Childers is coming up with a new pathology. No, I'm not. Apply knowledge. Uh, and if, if you think what I'm saying is some sort of new theory, then that indicates you don't know the actual knowledge you need to know. So um, the I start with uh, the construct of parental alienation um, because that's just awful. It's just awful, awful, awful. <laughs> and and so we, we need to stop using that. In 2017, I'm telling them, we need to stop doing parental alienation. So, in proposing the existence of a supposedly new form of pathology called parental alienation, which he claimed represented a new syndrome that was unique in all of mental health, identifiable by an equally unique new set of symptom identifiers made up specifically for this pathology alone, Richard Gardner led everyone off the path of professionally established constructs and principles and into the wilderness of professional ignorance and incompetence. Gardner was correct in identifying a family pathology surrounding divorce in which ch the child was induced by one parent to reject a relationship with the other parent. However, he was incorrect in claiming that the symptom features he identified represented a new form of pathology, a new syndrome. Gardner was simply a poor diagnostician. When he skipped the step of professional diagnosis, Gardner led everyone off the path of professional psychology and into the wilderness of ill-defined constructs and new forms of pathology. The family pathology of parental alienation is not a new form of pathology. Gardner was simply a poor diagnostician. It is long past overdue that professional psychology leave the wilderness of new forms of pathology and return to the established path of professional diagnosis that relies solely on established constructs and principles of professional psychology. The term parental alienation is a popularized term in the general culture, but it is not a defined psychopathology in clinical psychology. Professional level discussion and professional level practice needs to discontinue the use of the construct of parental alienation and return to the proper path, professional path, of defined constructs and principles within professional psychology. Um, 
A child's rejection of a parent is fundamentally an attachment pathology. It's a problem in love and bonding. That's the attachment system. We must leave the wilderness of new forms of pathology and return to the path of diagnosis using established constructs and principles of professional psychology. An attachment-based model of parental alienation. The attachment system is the brain system that governs all aspects of love and bonding throughout the lifespan, including grief and loss. A child rejecting a parent is fundamentally an attachment-related pathology. The deactivation of attachment behavior is a key feature of certain common variants of pathological mourning, Bowlby, 1980. Okay, so we know. We have, we have a symptom feature of a child rejecting a parent, a deactivation of attachment behavior. What's the cause? Pathological mourning in the child. It's a grief response in the child that's not getting processed. We need to rebond to the child so we can process the grief. It's a pathological mourning. We know that if you know the attachment system. And the reason there's a problem processing the emotion of sadness is it's stemming from the personality pathology of the allied parent, the narcissistic borderline personality cannot process the emotion of sadness. Disturbances of personality, which include a bias to respond to loss with disordered mourning, are seen as the outcome of one or more deviations in development that can originate or grow worse during any of the years of ch infancy, childhood, and adolescence. So we have personality uh, pathology in a parent, um, and that drawing on the, the established knowledge of Aaron Beck, Theodore Milan, Otto Kernberg. We have the narcissistic vulnerability is to rejection. The borderline vulnerability is to abandonment. Divorce involves both rejection and abandonment and will therefore trigger a full display of narcissistic and borderline personality pathology. We know this. We should expect this. We can anticipate this. The narcissistic personality is characterologically unable to process sadness, grief, and loss. We know this. They, they lock up on the emotion of sadness, grief, and loss. Instead, they translate sadness and grief into anger, resentment, and blame. Uh, from Otto Kernberg. Kernberg, top personality person on narcissistic and borderline. Listen, they, narcissists, are especially deficient in genuine feelings of sadness and mournful longing. Their incapacity for experiencing depressive reactions is a basic feature of their personalities. When abandoned or disappointment, disappointed by other people, they may show what on the surface looks like a depression, but which on further examination emerges as anger and resentment loaded with revengeful wishes, rather than real sadness for the loss of a person whom they appreciated. We know that the pathology of the rejected, the suppression of attachment behavior is caused by pathological mourning. And we know the narcissist personality locks up around sadness and it turns it into anger. We know this, this is established knowledge. The narcissistic and borderline personalities are variants of the same underlying core beliefs. I am fundamentally inadequate as a person and I will be rejected, abandoned because of my inadequacy. Turn sight to back. The divorce activates the core vulnerabilities of the narcissistic and borderline personalities of rejection and abandonment um, by the attachment figure of the spouse. They then seek to restore the narcissistic defense. I'm not the rejected one. You are. I'm not the inadequate one. You are. You're the inadequate parent, and you're being rejected because of your inadequacy. I'm the all-wonderful and ideal parent, and the child is choosing me and rejecting you. Okay, that's all to reestablish the narcissistic defense. The narcissistic parent psychologically manipulates the child into rejecting the other parent 
to techniques of psychological coercion, guilt induction, and the contingent application and withdrawal of love, called an invalidating environment by Linehan. Psychological control, Barber. Uh, look who published psycho the book, Intrusive Parenting, How Psychological Control Affects Children and Adolescents, published by the American Psychological Association. Psychological control refers to parental behaviors that are intrusive and manipulative of children's thoughts, feelings, and, attach and attachment to parents. Specifically, psychological control has historically been defined as psychologically and emotionally manipulative techniques or parental behaviors that are not responsive to children's psychological and emotional needs. Psychologically controlling parents create a coercive, unpredictable, or negative emotional climate of the family, which serves as one of the ways the family context influences children's emotional regulation. Such parenting strategies ignore the child's need for autonomy, impede the child's volitional functioning, and intervene in the individuation process. In such an environment, children feel pressure to conform to parental authority, which results in children's emotional insecurities and dependence. Okay, so let me just break off here for a second. So I am explaining to them in detail what the pathology is. I start with uh, attachment, move it into the personality, and we've got disordered mourning here. We've got the techniques of psychological control. I should not have to educate them. This should all be knowledge they already possess, and we should be talking about what to do about, but I'm having to educate the doctors about what the pathology is they're treating. Okay, That's the situation parents are finding themselves in. They're having to educate the doctors about what the pathology is. I had to do it in 2017. And did they listen? I, you know, they still don't know what the pathology is. They're still having questions saying it's complex. I don't know what this is. And then we have they're just ignorant, lack of knowledge and information. Google ignorant, lack of knowledge and information. If you're having to educate them, then that means they're ignorant by definition of you having to educate them. Ah, my goodness. So, but I'm educating, I'm doing it. Kerrig, in the Journal of Emotional Abuse, rather than telling the child directly what to do or think, as does the behaviorally controlling the parent, the psychologically controlling parent uses indirect hints and responds with guilt induction or the withdrawal of love if the child refuses to comply. In short, an intrusive parent strives to manipulate the child's thoughts and feelings in such a way that the child's psyche will conform to the parent's wishes. In order to carve out an island of safety and responsivity in an unpredictable, harsh, and depriving parent-child relationship, Children of highly maladaptive parents may become precocious caretakers who are adept at reading the cues and meeting the needs of those around them. That's our kids. And that's the ones we, we see them and everybody comments about how wonderful they are and the therapists just really like and that they're precocious caretakers. The kids are in the in the child abuse situation. They meet the needs of those around them, like the therapists who want to feel like wonderful therapists and they're, they're yeah. And they don't know that because they don't work child abuse. The ensuing preoccupied attachment with the parent, with the allied parent, with the parent interferes with the child's development of important ego functions, such as self-organization, affect regulation, and emotional object constancy. Those three things, ego functions, the ego functions, self-organization, affect regulation, and emotional object constancy are devastating constructs, okay? When you unpack those, oh, yikes, it's really damaging. By psychologically manipulating the child through techniques of psychological control, domination, guilt induction, and contingent love, the narcissistic borderline parent transfers his or her own fears of inadequacy, rejection, and abandonment onto the other spouse as a parent. So this is a psychological defense I'm explaining to him. The child is being used as a regulatory object to stabilize the fragile self-structure organization of the narcissistic borderline parent that is threatened with collapse in response to the inherent rejection, narcissistic vulnerability, and abandonment, borderline vulnerability, by the spousal attachment figure surrounding the divorce. 
So the parent's using the child as a regulatory object. The child's induced rejection of the other parent is being used to projectively displace onto the other spouse and narcissistic borderline parents own inadequacy and abandoned fears onto the other parent. So I'm not the rejected one, you are. I'm not the inadequate one, you are. You're the inadequate parent, spouse, person. You're the rejected parent, spouse, person, not me. I'm the wonderful and ideal parent spouse person. So this whole is this whole thing is a, a kabuki theater, um, a, a false display, a false in order to restore the narcissistic defense. So I just described the personality pathology. I described, um, you know, the sort of the origins of the defense and the projection displacement uh, process. Now I'm going to switch and explain the whole pathology again, applying a different school, a different set of professional knowledge from family systems pathology, Bowlby, Mnuchin, and Haley. We're going to talk about triangulation, cross-generational coalition, and emotional cutoffs. So from a family systems perspective, the child is being triangulated into the spousal conflict through the formation of a cross-generational coalition with the allied narcissistic borderline parent against the other parent, resulting in a cutoff in the family relationships. And Mnuchin... And Nichols' diagram, father and the child in a cross-generational coalition against the mother. You can see the cutoff there between the child and the mother. Uh, so the, the divorce uh, is simply a transition. It's not a big deal. So you go from an intact family structure that was united by the marital bond, and now we're into the separated family structure that's now united by the, the children. It's not a big deal. It's just a transition in family structure. However, it can transition into a pathological structure when we have the pathological mourning, the in, uh, inappropriate uh, inability to process the grief and sadness involved in that. The family locks up and we get a cutoff family structure. And so because of the pathological mourning here, I'm explaining everything to these psychologists that they should already know, but that was like seven years ago, I'm explaining. So high parental co conflict rips a child apart. So when we're going from, an, uh, let me pull this up for a second. When we're going from an intact family that was united by the marriage to a new separated family, the parents are living in new house, houses. Well, if, if there's a lot of conflict in the parents, that's going to rip the child apart. And so we want to we want to keep the parental uh, parental anger and stuff to a minimum, so that we don't rip the child apart in that situation. But that's what's happening in the, this situation because everybody's fighting around the kid. So um, yeah, and it only takes one parent. That's the the thing. It only takes one parent to create the conflict. So the mom on this side is not creating the conflict. She's she's a fine normal range mom. The dad's creating a conflict and forcing the child to choose sides in the conflict. Uh, want me to draw you a picture? I'll draw you a picture. Um, the narcissistic borderline parent creates a loyalty conflict to the child by forcing the child to choose sides in the spousal conflict. If the child tries to remain neutral, the child is placed in the middle and forced to choose. If the child tries to remain bonded to the other parent, the child is placed in the middle and forced to choose. Okay, so th that's the child is given one situation. The only escape for the child from being placed in the middle of the spousal conflict created by the narcissistic borderline parent is for the child to psychologically surrender to and take the side of the narcissistic borderline parent. So it's it's just a whole manipulative thing that the child is just put under pressure and it's it's relatively easy to do. All, all the uh, allied parent pathological narcissist has to do is create conflict and put the child in the middle of it and then just wait. And eventually the child will collapse onto their side just simply to get out of the middle of the conflict. And so it's really an easy thing for the, the pathological parent to do. Uh, so the all the mental health people in the courts need to get out of the conflict. You know, stop doing that. Um, stop putting the child in the middle. Oh, let me see. Oh, uh, yeah. So... Uh, but, so what is essentially involves is the death of a parent, though, this pathological transition. The child pays the price of losing a relationship with a beloved parent, but at least the child 
escapes being placed in the middle of the spousal conflict. And so it's a, you know, it's a terrible price to pay. Uh, so basically the, the, you know, the child used to have a mom or used to have a dad. And now they no longer have a mom or a dad after the divorce. It's like the parent died. Now, reunification therapy will be ineffective because reunification therapy simply tries to put the child back in the middle of the spousal conflict that's being created by the narcissistic borderline parent by turning the child into a psychological battleground between the efforts of therapy to restore the child's normal range relationship with the beloved but now rejected targeted parent and the ongoing efforts, manipulation, and psychological control of the narcissistic borderline parent to keep the child symptomatic. So if we just if we just try to put the child, make the child bond to the other parent, we're just putting the child in the middle until we get a handle on what the pathological narcissistic borderline parent is doing. And individual therapy will be equally ineffective because that's just maintaining the status quo. That's just putting a therapist into the pathological family. So individual therapy simply will simply allow things to remain forever unchanged. And the individual therapist will be in, drawn into colluding with the pathology by validating the child's false beliefs about the supposed inadequacy of the beloved but now rejected targeted parent without ever obtaining direct firsthand experience of the parent-child relationship. So those individual therapists are deeply problematic. Okay, they're they're participating in creating the child, the psychological child abuse and stuff. They're participants in it because they're practicing beyond boundaries of competence and a lot of, a lot of problematic issues. And I'm explaining that to them in detail. I'm explaining to them why their reunification therapy isn't working. Okay, for 40 years your reunification therapy hasn't worked, and so you want to know why? I'm explaining it to, them. and I'm explaining why your individual therapy isn't working. That's this is what it is. I shouldn't have to explain to them, but lack of information and knowledge. Google ignorant. These they are ignorant mental health, and they don't care. You know that's a problem. They don't care. So I've just explained everything to them from personality disorders, and I explained everything from a family systems perspective. Now I'll shift gears and apply a new set of knowledge. The, uh, the transgenerational transmission of attachment pathology. So the narcissistic borderline personality was created in childhood attachment trauma. Various studies have found that patients with borderline personality disorder are characterized by disorganized attachment representations. Such attachment representations appear to to be typical for persons with unresolved childhood traumas, especially when parental figures are, were involved with direct frightening behavior of the parent. <sighs> From Bowlby, disturbances of personality, which include a bias to respond to loss with disordered mourning, are seen as the outcome of one of more deviations in development that can originate or grow worse during any of the years of infancy, childhood, and adolescence. Personality disorders are the response to unresolved trauma. So it's attachment trauma, complex trauma, relationship-based trauma. The attachment system of the narcissistic borderline parent is activated by the divorce to mediate the loss experience, the loss of the attachment-mediated spousal relationship. So I'm explaining things at a neurological level now, the attachment system level. When the attachment system of the narcissistic borderline parent is activated, so are the trauma networks, the internal working models of attachment trauma contained in the attachment system of the narcissistic borderline parent. There is a neurological foundation to this. The simultaneous activation of two sets, simultaneous, boop, boop, two sets, of representational networks in the attachment system of the narcissistic borderline parent, one from the past, okay, childhood trauma, and one for the current relationships, creates a neurologically based psychological equivalency in these representational networks. They got two brain networks activating at the same time, they become equivalent. The childhood attachment trauma pattern 
okay now this now bowlby would call these the internal working models of attachment beck calls them schemas freud called it the transference so these are this is an established construct these these attachment patterns um that that are in our brain networks the divorce activates two sets of representational networks okay one from the past childhood trauma one from the current relationships the past childhood trauma is in the pattern of victimized child abusive parent protective parent okay there's a little split there on the abusive parent protective parent and it's a little psychological thing going on but victimized child abusive parent protective parent that's your your classic trauma pattern of child abuse and then we have the current relationships which is a child a parent and a parent okay so they're not the 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 trauma pattern isn't in the current relationship however when you get two of these activating they they overlap they become the same equivalent so the concurrent activation of two sets of representational networks in the attachment system of the narcissistic borderline parent creates a fusion, a psychological equivalency of these neurological networks. So now in their mind, we have a victimized current child, we have an abusive targeted parent, and we have the protective alienating parent. That's the origins of your false trauma reenactment narrative. We have... The targeted parent becomes the abusive parent. The current child becomes the victimized child. And the narcissistic borderline becomes a protective parent as this narcissistic borderline unresolved trauma parent at reenacts their own childhood trauma in the current family relationships, the transference. It's a false drama. Okay. Created in the childhood attachment trauma experienced by the narcissistic borderline parent many years ago that are embedded in the internal working model schemas of the parents' attachment networks. I'm explaining everything to them from Perlman and Coutiz. Now, listen, let's look at that journal article, okay? The journal title, Clinical Applications of the Attachment Framework, Relational Treatment of Complex Trauma. Okay, dead on. This is not family court journal. This is actual real knowledge journal in the Journal of Traumatic Stress. So one of one primary transference counter transference dynamic involves reenactment of familiar roles of victim, perpetrator, rescuer, bystander in the therapy relationship. Therapist and client pay, play out these roles often in complementary fashion with one another as they relive various aspects of the client's early attachment history. Okay. We know this. This is established knowledge, okay? application of the, the, to attachment pathology. I am educating the doctors about the pathology they are, te they are treating, diagnosing and treating. I should never have to do that. <sighs> now notice a bystander role. Okay, I highlight the bystander role for everybody who was at that presentation. Because I shouldn't have to educate you, but now I'm educating you about you. The bystander role is filled by all the mental health and legal professionals. The role of the bystander mental health and legal professional, you, is to legitimize the false trauma reenactment narrative by acting as if it is true. Shame the targeted parent publicly by accusing them of being this awful parent when that's not true. And serve as a witness to the narcissistic grandiosity of the all-wonderful narcissistic borderline parent who displays as the protective parent to everybody and you believe it. Okay, so I'm explaining to them what they're doing. The narcissistic and borderline personality is a master at manipulation. There is none better. They are especially skilled at manipulating others to become allies. The narcissistic and borderline personality. Uh, okay. These allied mental health prof and legal professionals allow themselves to be manipulated into colluding with the enactment of the pathology within the family. Oh, my goodness. The narcissistic personality manipulates and obtains allies through their assertion of confidence, self-confidence, 
a, a confident self-assurance that they just sort of everybody kind of bonds to the narcissist because they're so emotionally expansive. The borderline personality manipulates and obtains allies through the presentation of helpless vulnerability and victimization. Oh, I'm being abused and oh, protect me because these evil people are doing bad things to me. That's how they acquire, manipulate and acquire allies. Mental health and legal professionals who have their own family of origin issues are especially vulnerable to being recruited into becoming allies of the narcissistic borderline parent. It's called countertransference and is as old as Freud. I'm educating them about Freud. Oh my goodness. Professional confidence. Okay. Now we've reached the point where I'm there for a reason. I'm not there to educate them. They're, they should already know this stuff. I, I educated them to get to this point that they have obligations to be competent. Okay, and they're ethical obligations, okay, professional obligations. And so that's what we're headed into right now is my alerting them as to what their obligations are. So domains of professional competence, the attachment related pathology, traditionally called parental alienation, represents a complex interplay of four domains of pathology. Attachment-related pathology, family systems pathology, personality disorder pathology, complex trauma. Now, to step aside for a second, step into 2024. Uh, remember my ethics uh, 1.04. If when a psychologist believes there's an ethical violation by another psychologist, they attempt to resolve the issue by bringing into the attention of that individual. If that an informal resolution appears appropriate and intervention does not violate any confidentiality rights that may be involved. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. I'm bringing it to their attention, uh, what the concerns uh, involved are. The, uh, the concerns are to standard 2.01, boundaries of competence. Psychologists provide services, teach, and conduct research with populations and in areas only within the boundaries of their competence based on their education, training, supervised, supervised experience, consultation, study, or professional experience. And 2.04, bases for scientific and professional judgments. Psychologists' work is based upon established scientific and professional knowledge of the discipline. So those are my ethical concerns relative to what every one of them is doing. And that's my ethical obligation to act and make them aware of that situation, bring it to their attention. Um, so here we go. Mental health professionals who are assessing, diagnosing, and treating attachment-related pathology need to be professionally knowledgeable and competent in the attachment system, what it is, how it functions, and how it characteristically dysfunctions. Failure to possess professional-level knowledge regarding the attachment system when assessing, diagnosing, and treating attachment-related pathology would represent practice beyond the boundaries of professional competence in violation of professional standards of practice. Am I being clear? Mental health professionals who are assessing, diagnosing, and treating personality disorder-related pathology as it affect, it is, it's affecting family relationships need to be professionally knowledgeable and competent in personality disorder pathology. And these slides just go on and do the same thing. Failure to possess professional level knowledge regarding personality disorder pathology when assessing and diagnosing and treating personality related pathology would represent practice beyond the boundaries of competence uh, in violation of professional standards of practice. Mental health professionals treating families we need to know be competent in family systems. Failure to possess professional knowledge regarding the functioning of family systems and the principles of family systems therapy when assessing, diagnosing, and treating family pathology would represent practice beyond the boundaries of competence and uh, in violation of professional ethical standards. Mental health. Professionals who are treating, diagnosing, and treating the transgenerational transmission of complex trauma need to be knowledgeable about complex trauma and the transgenerational co transmission of complex trauma, or, or else they're practicing beyond the boundaries of their competence uh, in violation of ethical standards of practice. Okay, so there's my notification. Okay, 
bring it to their attention, it said. I documented it in, into the record here. I brought it to their attention in 2017, the concerns uh, relative to my obligations under 1.04. So I just discharged my ethical obligations, understand 1.04. Okay, now there is no such thing in clinical psychology as parental alienation. That is a made up pathology. There is pathological mourning. There is triangulation, cross-generational coalitions and emotional cutoffs. There is the collapse of narcissistic and borderline personality structure surrounding divorce. There is a transgenerational transmission of attachment trauma, but there is no such thing in clinical psychology as parental alienation. It is a made up form of new pathology. Mental health professionals need to use standard and established psychological constructs and principles to diagnose pathology. Mental health professionals are currently assessing, diagnosing, and treating an attachment-related pathology without expertise in the attachment system, a family systems pathology without expertise in family systems, personality disorder pathology without expertise in personality disorder pathology. There's my notification relative to standard 1.04. In proposing a new form of pathology, a new syndrome, Richard Gardner led everyone away from the path of professional psychology and into the wilderness of professional incompetence. It is time to leave the wilderness of new forms of pathology and return to professional standards of practice in the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of pathology to find through the standard and established constructs and principles of professional psychology. An attachment-based model of parental alienation, ABPA, is based entirely within the standard and established constructs and principles of professional psychology. ABA returns to the established path of professional psychology. ABPA is not a theory. ABPA is diagnosis. Diagnosis is the application of standard and established constructs and principles to a set of symptoms diagnosis diagnostic indicators of pathogenic parenting three diagnostic indicators of attachment based parental alienation attachment system suppression towards a normal range parent narcissistic personality traits in the child symptom display and encapsulated persecutory delusion in the child symptom display diagnostic indicator one Attachment system suppression. The attachment system never spontaneously dysfunctions. The attachment system only becomes dysfunctional in response to pathogenic parenting. Patho, pathology, genic, genesis, creation. Pathogenic parenting is create the creation of significant pathology in the child, attachment pathology in this case, through aberrant and distorted parenting practices. Narcissistic personality traits. Five narcissistic personality traits are evidenced in the child's symptom display. These are the, the psychological fingerprint evidence of the psychological control of the child by a narcissistic borderline parent. We cannot psychologically control a child without leaving psychological fingerprints of the control in the child's symptom display. Diagnostic indicator three, the child evidences a fixed and false belief uh, a delusion that the child is supposedly being victimized by the normal range parenting of the targeted projected parent. This symptom represents the child being incorporated into a false trauma reenactment narrative of the narcissistic borderline parent that is in the pattern of abusive parent, victimized child and protective parent, and it's displaying the victimized child role. So those are the diagnostic indicator of for pathogenic parenting. That should be routinely connected, collected. It's up on my consulting website. Just routinely, the mental health person, just check, check, check. Is there attachment system suppression towards a normal range parent? Attachment system is a motivational system. It always has direction. That's what a motivational system is. Regulatory systems can go up and down. Ta motivational systems always have direction. Eating system, sex, pleasure, pain, it always, a, always has a direction. Direction of attachment bonding is always to bond, form a bond because the other direction is death through predation and starvation. So a child rejecting a parent, a, a child who's seeking to sever a parent-child bond, uh, there's only one cause of that, which is child abuse range parenting. And so that's if you have a, but if you have a normal range parent and the child's 
trying to sever a bond to a normal range parent, that's a false factitious attachment pathology. So that, that's that's symptom one of factitious attachment pathology. That never happens. Then you have the fingerprints of psychological control, the narcissistic traits that displayed by a child, and then you have a persecutory delusion displayed by the child. There's, a, there's only one thing that can cause that, which is the shared persecutory delusion, the factitious attachment pathology that you just diagnosed in the symptom display. So that's up on my website. You can grab that. Um, the presence of these three diagnostic indicators in the child's symptom display represents definitive diagnostic evidence of the attachment-based parental alienation. No other pathology in all of mental health will pr produce this specific set of three child symptoms, all three in the child's symptom display, except ABPA as described in Foundations. There's your diagnostic checklist. It's up on my website. You can go grab it. Pathogenic parenting that is creating significant developmental pathology in the child, diagnostic indicator one, the attachment system suppression. Personality disorder pathology in the child, diagnostic two, uh, indicator two, the narcissistic symptoms. And delusional psychiatric pathology in the child, diagnostic indicator three, a delusional thought disorder, is a DSM-5 diagnosis of the 995.51 child psychological abuse confirmed uh, assessment, reestablishing professional standards of practice. Uh, okay. Assessment leads to diagnosis. Diagnosis guides treatment. Here's standard 9.01, bases for assessments. Psychological, psychology based the opinions contained in the recommendations, reports, and diagnostic or evaluative statements, including forensic testimony, on information and techniques sufficient to substantiate their findings. So there's my standard 1.04 again, notifying them of a potential ethical violation here, uh, bringing it to the attention of that individual. So now I have uh, met my obligations, discharged my obligations under 1.04, notifying them about standard 2.04, the basis for uh, scientific and professional judgments concerns, informal notification of standard 2.01, boundaries of competence concerns, and informal notification of 9.01, basis for assessment concerns. So I have now notified them of all the ethical concerns related to what they do. Okay, so the attachment system never spontaneously dysfunctions. The attachment system only dysfunctions in response to pathogenic parenting. Pathogenic parenting is the creation of significant psychopathology in the child through aberrant and distorted parenting practices. Now I'm building to the failure and duty to protect. Pathogenic parent caregiving is an established construct in both developmental and clinical psychology. Pathogenic parenting is most commonly used in reference to attachment-related pathology because that's the only thing that causes attachment-related pathology is pathogenic parenting. If a mental health professional has not even assessed for pathogenic parenting associated with an attachment-related pathology, then the diagnostic statements and forensic testimony by this mental health professional cannot possibly be based on information and techniques to sufficiently substantiate their findings. When, they, when a, we are assessing for pathogenic parenting associated with an attachment pathology in the child, not for parental alienation, elevating their standards of practice. Treatment for child, uh, child psychological abuse. Assessment leads to diagnosis. Diagnosis guides treatment. Pathogenic parenting that's creating developmental pathology, personality disorder pathology, and delusional psychiatric pathology in the child is a diagnosis of child psychological abuse. So the protective separation and treatment, I drew a little picture here. You start at the top, there's the family conflict and the cutoff family structure. First thing we do is we put a protective separation. We get the child over with mom. The child's not yet bonded into mom. The next phase is we get we reestablish the child's bond to mom. We remove the protective separation and reestablish and get we go from the top corner to the bottom corner of a healthy separated family structure. That's how the step by step we do it. And then we toss a therapist on that to stabilize the family conflict. So you see that little bottom corner one? 
remember that image. I'm, we're going to come back to it because that's the ultimate uh, goal we're looking for is we want a healthy separated family structure and we toss a therapist on it to monitor a family therapist on it to monitor the, the conflict in the parents so it doesn't rip the family apart okay so remember that that little piece right there because that's our goal protective separation everybody worries about the protective separation diagnosis guides treatment if there's pathogenic parenting creating developmental pathology, personality pathology, psychiatric pathology, it's child psychological abuse, diagnosis guides treatment. <sighs> Duty to protect. In all cases of child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, the standard of practice and duty to protect requires a child's protective separation from the abusive uh, parent during treatment and recovery. There it is. Okay, there's my duty to protect notification one. The, the DSM diagnosis of child psychological abuse activates professional duty to protect obligations. So now, in this 2017 AFCC uh, uh, presentation, I have notified them of the three ethical violations of concern. 2.01 boundaries of competence, 2.04 bases for scientific and professional judgments, 9.01 bases for assessment. I have described in detail the pathology to them, educated them because I'm a nice guy. Um, you know, so kind of you need to get up to quality uh, practice. And now I have notified them of their duty to protect obligations relative to the diagnosis involved of child psychological abuse. There's no such thing as parental alienation. That's a euphemism for child psychological abuse. And it, it's masking and covering what the pathology actually is. When you actually apply knowledge, the diagnosis is child psychological abuse. So any, di any description that's not child psychological abuse is masking and is not applying actual knowledge to the, the situation. So... Um, Therapy. The child is then treated. So first we get a protective separation of the child. That's okay. Duty to protect. Um, in all cases, we separate the child from the abusive parent. Then the child is then treated for the damaging consequences of the child abuse and the child's normal range and healthy development is recovered and restored. Then we reintroduce the abusive parent when the child's normal range and healthy development has been restored. The formerly abusive parent is then reintroduced with sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that the child abuse does not resume. During the period of protective separation, the abusive parent is typically required to obtain individual therapy to gain and demonstrate insight into the causes of the prior abuse. The degree of supervision surrounding the reintroduction of this parent is typically based on the parent's cooperation with therapy. Um, this is true for physical abuse, child abuse. This is true for sexual child abuse. This is true for psychological child abuse. Diagnosis guides treatment. The protective separation is based on the DSM-5 diagnosis of B995.51, child psychological abuse. So the narcissistic borderline parent is creating significant degree of psychopathology in the child. So you see the child's all distorted over there. The developmental pathology, personality pathology, delusional psychiatric pathology. And we are taking this distorted child and we are removing them putting in a protective separation, but the child's still not bonded. We're going to add a family therapist to help the child get back normal again, to get rid of all the little bumpy stuff on the child and get the child back bonded with a, with a formerly targeted parent. And then we'll remove the, the separation period, put a the family therapist now manages the interspousal conflict and the child um, goes back to a normal range family. And again, remember that bottom outcome goal, that's our treatment goal. So the goal is the success, a successful and relatively normal range separated family structure with long-term stabilization by a mental health professional who is knowledgeable and qualified in ABPA. And it, there's no such thing as ABPA. So it's knowledgeable and qualified in the established knowledge of attachment and family systems and personality disorder and complex trauma and a lot to know, but so what? <laughs> that's that's the requirement. If you're going to work in the family courts, you have to know a lot. Um, and so, again, this is child psychological. I'm just driving this home for them, slide after slide. I'm telling them, this is child psychological abuse. You have duty to protect obligations. 
um, in all cases of child abuse, a professional standard of practice and duty to protect requires a child's protective separation from the abusive parent during treatment and recovery. That's my, uh, so twice uh, now, I have put that slide in twice to notify them of their duty to protect obligations. In 2017, seven years ago, okay, the key to solving high conflict divorce in the family. So I, now I'm going into the solution. This is where I'm at now, is, is to talk about this solution. Amicus attorney and ABPA certified mental health professional. So I'll debate this anytime. The role of child attorneys, GALs, and parenting coordinators in custody litigation. Let's do this online. Look at how I'm doing a presentation online. Stop thinking Flatlander. Let's get, let's get, let's get a debate. Dr. Childress and somebody. Um, the role of child attorneys, GALs, and parenting coordinators in custody litigation. I'll argue for an amicus attorney. And I'll say that's the only thing we need. We can get rid of everybody else. We just need an amicus attorney. That's my position. Then you find somebody who argues in favor of the minors council GAL parenting coordinators menagerie that you currently have. Find somebody who's willing to argue for that. Then you put us in, in the debate online, two-hour mediated, 90-minute mediated. Um, I'm, I'm in. I'll do it. Um, the adversarial foundation of the legal system contributes to and fosters a continuing conflict uh, within high conflict families. Normal range divorce transition. You go from a normal range intact family to a new separated family united by the children. High conflict divorce rips the children apart, leaving a uh, pathological cutoff family. Reunification therapy just puts the child in the middle. Individual therapy leaves everything unchanged. Uh, it, it's a pathogenic parenting, um, and that's our goal, that we start with the child, we get all the way to the treatment goal with the goal of this. So, high conflict divorce, the family law solution, the key, it, uh, and it, an ABA, ABPA knowledgeable amicus attorney teamed with an ABPA certified mental health professional. That, I, I call it a key because it looks like a key. You get an amicus attorney representing the interests of the court and the child's treatment. You get an amicus attorney who's knowledgeable about what the pathology is in real stuff, teamed with a mental health professional who's knowledge about, about the pathology as real stuff. And you put them together. Then you insert them into these families. And you remember that little structure of the end goal there you see the end goal structure and now you have an amicus attorney in the court and that's how you get the court involvement and look you can replicate that from family to family and it's so easy and then you the court just we just get a a, a pool of qualified high caliber mental health people and a pool of knowledgeable amicus attorneys that the court can choose on to construct its keys. And when it has a family, it just puts an amicus attorney who's knowledgeable together with a therapist who's knowledgeable and they fix the family. So the teaming of an ABPA knowledgeable amicus attorney with an ABPA certified mental health professional uh, reduces the adversarial context of the family law system surrounding high conflict divorce which allows each party to remain uh, retain separate legal counsel as desired to ensure protection of their legal rights so the parents can maintain their own counsel we're just putting a and we're not over empowering the child though we're not giving the child an attorney 10 year old child doesn't need an attorney but if you want an attorney in the court does and, and it's legitimate the court the, the the court has a legitimate concern in the child's well-being Okay, that, that, and so the court, yeah, an attorney involved for the court, GAL role, a minor's counsel role tries, they, they try this role, but, but it's really appoint somebody within that role that it's representing the court's interests in effective treatment, team them up with the treatment provider, get both of them knowing what they're doing. So we, and the judge knows what they're doing and everybody's using the same knowledge and everybody's doing the same thing. Okay. Pilot program for the family courts. Let's put this together. It's easy peasy. And then we have the structural model and, and we can stop fighting about these kids. Okay. So there it is. So the teaming of an ABPA knowledgeable amic attorney with a certified mental health professional is the key to solving high conflict divorce in the family law system. So then we transition to the high road protocol, the catalytic psychoeducational intervention, and that's to be continued. I'll continue over with the high road next. And that's so exciting. I'm going to explain 
how the high road protocol protocol does what it does okay without giving away um corporate secrets or uh, intellectual property rights of Ms. Pritter. So uh, this is what we talked about at the AFCC in 2017. And we told them what the high road does. We told them what the pathology is. I told them what their ethical obligations, duty to protect, explained it in detail, 2017, seven years ago. And now we have their coming, their, their coming uh, situation. Now, oh, just as an epilogue, this is an interesting epilogue to the 27 presentation is Jean Mercer in continuing education because there's a little bit of controversy around that presentation that I just gave you. They, the AFCC, get this, the AFCC withdrew the continuing education credits for all the attendees that heard what I talked about. So that was the response to the AFCC of being given on a silver platter the knowledge about what the pathology is explained to them on a silver platter and alerting them to their ethical violations and their duty to protect obligations. Their response formally was to withdraw the continuing education credits for everybody who was at that seminar. Why would they do that? Well, because Gene Mercer launched a campaign of slander against Dr. Childers and Dorsey Pruder that, that I didn't know about. Nobody contacted me. Nobody told me. But they just withdrew the CE units based on what Jean Mercer uh, campaigned about. And she writes about this on her blog. So following this presentation in 2017, Dr. Jean Mercer launched a campaign with the AFCC to have continuing education units withdrawn from this presentation for an unclear reason. And so here's from uh, Dr. Gene Mercer's blog, 12, 13, 17. In September 2017, I filed a complaint about the presentation by Craig Childress and Dorsey Pruder at the conference of the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, AFCC, earlier in 2017. And so she has two blogs. They're still up there. You can go read them. Um, in one, the first one where she makes that statement. And then the second one, interesting times in parental alienation world, is when they withdrew the the CE units and, and she crows about it. The first one, she also talks about how she does the same thing with other professionals. So when she disagrees with, with the content of what they're talking about, she goes after them on technicalities around CE units and then makes the argument that, that the CE units are withdrawn because of content when that's not true. She just got it on a technicality or something. It was probably a technicality related to Dorsey, okay? Because it's not anything, obviously it's not anything I'm saying that that's in violation of anything. I'm talking about Otto Kernberg, for goodness sake. So I'm, I'm not sure why the CE units would be withdrawn relative to my talk. So then you know, watch the CE, watch the Dorsey Pruder one and see why would they withdraw CE units from that talk about Dorsey Pruders and the High Road Workshop. Hmm, I don't know, but that, that's what the, uh, the AFCC did. So with that, um, that's my 2017 talk to the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. So then um, um, the second part of that talk with Dorsey Pruder uh, was on the High Road Protocol. And then what I'll be doing next is uh, for the 2024 um, AFCC uh, presentation um, or on the theme of child safety. Okay, so I told them, you saw two slides, child safety, there's child abuse diagnosis, seven years later, they're wondering about child safety. Okay, so I'll catch them up on that. Okay, get them current to 2024 on where we stand on child safety issues, because I told them about that 2017. So they're, they're a little slow on the uptake, it would seem. So with that, um, good luck to everybody. And